All right, before we head in today uh, on the applied level, uh, the uh, new addition uh, last week uh, was understanding gold mining. And here I use uh, Newmont Mining. Uh, the video is about, I think, 50, 55 minutes long, and then there's about a 45 to 50 minute walkthrough uh, through Newmont's uh, 10K. Also this week, I will be making uh, one video uh, from the applied level free for everyone so that uh, because I've asked can we see what it looks like so I will make this one the understanding gold mining I will make this video free uh, for a limited period of time so you see here this is the applied level preview limited time access sometime this week I believe on Tuesday sometime uh, it will be available so you're going to want to watch my LinkedIn I will put you need the link uh, you, you're not going to be able to find it without the link I have to give you the link uh, I'll put the link on uh, LinkedIn and I'll make uh, a short video uh, on YouTube which will have the link. It's free. Uh, you can see uh, what these videos look like, the understanding series, and there's a lot of them. I've done understanding banking, understanding timber REITs, uh, understanding utilities, uh, semiconductors, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, mining. This is gold mining, which is the second entry in the understanding mining series. I probably will do coal mining because I think that's rather interesting. Uh, but this will be available uh, for free till uh, the end of May. Uh, so you'll have access to it uh, till the end of May. So before we head in and look at rates, let's uh, have a look at retail sales. We got that last week. It was a pretty good number. Uh, March 2024.7, February revised up to 0.9. So there is the revision down here. It was 0.6 up to 0.9. Let's head down to one of the tables. Now we have 0.7 on retail sales. If we remove uh, the categories that include gasoline uh, or gas stations and motor vehicle parts and repairs, retail here at 0.8, which is a pretty healthy number. And throughout the week, uh, on the back of this, and strong economic data and CPI that seems to be stickier than what we would like to see, you sort of have the Fed, I don't know, what would you call it, pivoting their message uh, that uh, uh, Williams were in no rush to cut rates, Bostic, uh, you know, why would we cut rates at this point, Powell, uh, it is likely that rates will be at this level for longer than we originally thought. And, uh, dare I say, even a hint that uh, coming if the data stays this way, that June may actually see a rate increase. I think that's going to be hard to get done, a rate increase. That if they feel that inflation uh, is sticky, I think we'll get a good indication at the May meeting, if they announce a taper to the balance sheet runoff, I think they're looking past this stuff, uh, which if we think about the fiscal position uh, and the amount of debt, I can understand why they would say, listen, we can't continue to fight this battle because we're just making the next battle even bigger and more of a losing proposition that maybe uh, a respectable retreat from this battle makes sense so that we can fight the next battle or at least prepare to fight the next battle. And I have some news, some new data on uh, U.S. Treasuries that I think are going to be important. If we see uh, no taper in May, because uh, a taper is a, some form of easing, that means they're going to be stepping into the Treasury market uh, and buying uh, rather than letting 60 billion runoff, they let 30 billion runoff, so they'll be net buyers of 30 billion in treasuries uh, or T-bills. Uh, depends on where they want to stick their uh, stick their duration. Um, if they go ahead and taper in May, then I think no, I don't think that there'd be a rate increase. I think you probably would be looking at uh, a rate cut for June if there's going to be a, a cut June. Uh, if they don't taper in May. Uh, and save that to June, uh, then there'll be no rate cut. I don't think they're going to cut and taper at the same time. I think they'll taper first, then cut. So no taper in May, no cut in June. A taper in May, eh, I think maybe a cut in June. Okay, let's have a look at our yields. 
Uh, money market yields all still well behaved. We still have a bear steepener going on on the long end of the curve. Yields are higher from the two year out to the 30 year. Uh, almost uh, by the same amount, nine uh, ranges what, nine to 12. Uh, you can call that uh, as close to a parallel shift on the long end of the curve as you can get. Uh, curve inversion still remains 641 days on the capital market curve. Uh, inverted 35 basis points. Money market to capital market, 524 days, uh, 83 basis points. Canada's 122 on that one. Uh, balance sheet, 7.4 trillion, down from 7.438 trillion, down 32.67 billion. The SOMA's run off by 35 billion, so there was a net increase of 2.5 billion. The Treasury, we'll see on the next screen, the Treasury General account really boosted up because, well, April 15th was uh, tax payment date. So a lot of money uh, went into the Treasury General account. Look at this. Foreign holdings of U.S. Treasuries have hit a record high, $7.965 trillion. To put that in context, there's some $34 trillion in U.S. Treasuries out there. However, if you take uh, out all of the interdepartmental holdings, in other words, uh, you know, one part of government holds treasuries, if you, if you eliminate all of that, the biggest one being the SOMA, of course, you get to about 26 to 27 billion, uh, and you've got roughly 8 billion held by foreigners. Um, all that money, the interest on that money, leaves the country. This is the country getting poorer. This is a bad situation to be in. The um, duration of the Treasury uh, holdings, or, or the, uh, well, the Treasury issues securities, right? They issue T-bills, they issue uh, notes, uh, and they issue bonds. Notes are up to 10 years, bonds are longer than 10 years, and bills are uh, less than uh, one year or uh, less. Uh, the duration of their liabilities is about 6.5. So, meaning average maturity of about seven years, we've been uh, with elevated rates, let's say, for two years. So, two, fit, two, uh, two sevenths of the debt has been turning over at higher rates. And as each month goes by, there's new issuance to replace issuance of everything maturing. Uh, so, if rates are held at this uh, level for longer, the average interest cost will continue to increase. For 2024, just to put it into context, uh, the uh, amount of interest that has to be paid on the debt in the U.S. equals the defense budget. Uh, that's the biggest line item in the U.S. is defense. We're number one, we're number one, that kind of thing. Well, that costs money to say that. Uh, in Canada, the interest on uh, the debt is equal to the health care budget in which Canada seems to be rather proud of their free health care that you do pay for. Uh, it is uh, sort of a misnomer that we don't pay for health care. We do pay for health care. When you fill out your taxes, when you get to the provincial part, there is a spot in there for your health care premiums. Uh, now they're low. I pay $750. Uh, but I pay $750 uh, to get zero access to that free health care. So I am paying money, or I, I was paying money for years to have no access to the free health care. I want you to think about that sentence and how odd that sounds. But the interest expense is now equal to that. And a lot of it is leaving the country, which means the country is getting poorer, foreign holdings uh, at, that, uh, at that level. That money is being sent outside of the country. The IMF has warned about the level of debt. The Congressional Budget Office is saying, listen, by 2028, this is going to start to get ridiculous. By 2040, we're at 166% of debt to GDP. Unsustainable. IMF calls uh, the direction uh, that the U.S. is on right now unsustainable. Uh, this is the bigger problem. This is the bigger problem going forward. Inflation is a problem today, but this is a huge problem, and it's not on the horizon. It's here. Uh, you you have a narrow window to get out of this. Uh, the first thing you have to do is stop increasing the debt so dramatically. 
Well, good luck with that in uh, democracies. That's not going to happen. The other thing is you got to make it as free as possible. You got you you have to reduce the cost of that debt uh, so that less and less money flows out of the country. The only way you're going to get that done is with the Fed. And if you think, well, the market will just respond on the capital end of the curve, well, then you have yield curve control. You will have to do what Japan did. Japan is a look into our future. When you have that much debt, you have to have some kind of debt manager that is managing that. So the Fed will become a debt manager uh, because, well, I don't see any fiscal prudence coming in. Um, so I don't think that inflation uh, is going to find its way all the way down to 2% before the Fed starts cutting because the longer they wait, uh, the worse this ratio will become of, of how much of the new debt versus the existing debt is at the higher rates. Uh, and at higher rates, you're going to probably get more foreign holdings because why not? Why not take uh, U.S. dollars? Why not take them? Uh, and more money will leave the country uh, when your line items uh, for interest, just the interest on your debt, are equaling the things that each country is so very proud of. Well, then... It will not be long before the biggest line item is interest, and each country will have to be proud of that. I don't know if that's something to be proud of. Uh, money market funds decreased by $112 billion. Sounds like a lot, but keep in mind, taxes. You had taxes that were due April 15th that had to be paid for. Usually money in advance of taxes moves into very liquid assets. Like, like like money market funds, and then to be paid, they're paid uh, from their retail down 15 billion, institutions down 96 billion, down in all categories. But I don't know that we can take much away from this because that was taxes. But we are under the six trillion, uh, the six trillion dollar mark now. We are 10 days away from the FOMC, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. This week we get a big number. Q1 GDP, our advanced look at, at Q1, we get that in four days. The expectation is for 2.1%. I think GDP now, Atlanta Fed is at, I think last I saw, 2.4, 2.6. Uh, PCE in five days, we get that on Friday. That is the Fed's preferred measure because this measure is what consumers are actually spending money on, not some static basket of goods. Uh, but what they're actually buying. Uh, there is some debt auctions this week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the 2, the 5, the 7. Uh, I don't know that they're going to move markets very much. And for uh, Canadians up there, Bank of Canada deliberations we get in three days. This is their version of uh, the minutes. At the last press conference, it was asked whether or not uh, there was anybody who was talking about uh, rate cuts. And Macklem gave a very cagey answer, and at the end said, "Well, you're going to get you're going to get the deliberations in a couple of weeks anyway, so you'll see there." That is going to be interesting to read. I will be all over that. Uh, for those of you who watched the uh, federal budget last Tuesday night, um, capital gains inclusion uh, went from 50 percent to 60 percent to 66 percent uh, for those. Uh, making over 250000 in capital gains, which means uh, you're at a 53.5% tax rate. If you're making over two hundred and fifty dollars uh, in capital gains, you are at that rate um, because you, you're obviously uh, um, generating other forms of income as well to get that. Uh, so that is basically putting uh, your tax rate on capital gains, which was 26.75 up to 35.31%. So you have almost a 9% increase uh, in, your, uh, in your income. So for an extra million, you got to pay uh, well, roughly another $9,000. Now you may think, well, 9000 on a million. That's 9000 on top of everything you're already paying. It's an incremental 9000 It's just another little bit, another little bit. The interesting thing here, if we look at Norway, Norway uh, has had a cash outflow, has had capital outflow for about the last two years. And the left-leaning government has raised the wealth tax. And there's even more money leaving. Now the wealth managers are leaving as well. And this money's going to Switzerland. They estimate on a U.S. basis about $46 billion has, have less, has, has left Norway in the last two years. 
Um, this is what happens when you um, decide that capital uh, should be taxed at the same rate as labor, is you chase capital away. And we have uh, a form of uh, our economic form is capitalism, not laborism. Uh, capital built this country. No matter what Biden wants to tell you that the middle class built it, no matter what the unions want to tell you that labor built it, capital built these countries. Uh, and when you decide to punish capital, capital will leave. If if labor were the key factor in building a country, and I've said this before, India and China would have been the richest countries on this planet decades ago by a country mile if all you needed was labor. They had way more labor than the U.S., but they had no capital. Uh, the developed countries had all the capital, and look where they are. Capital built this country. When you go after capital, uh, capital can leave. That's the thing about capital. Maybe you can't leave the country, but your capital can leave the country. Uh, and higher tax rates will push capital away. This capital gains inclusion in Canada. I mean, I left. I left and I took my capital with me because I saw this coming. I saw higher tax rates coming. Where else? Are the, you've got to pay for all of this mountain of debt. The U.S. and Canada have to pay for this mountain of debt. You can't tax people who don't make money. You can't tax people who make a little bit of money. And you can't tax the middle class because you need to get reelected. So you have to tax success. And you will chase away capital because you think, well, if they leave, oh, it's one person leaving, one vote, who cares? It's, it's the weight of the capital leaving. When I left Canada, you, you would need about 200 immigrants making the average income to replace the tax base that you lost with me. You'd need 200 to replace that. You'd need even more because you need social services for those 200. You need health care for those 200 that you got to pay for. Uh, so this, this, these left-leaning governments who decide that labor is the hero and capital is the enemy uh, are well on their way to becoming developing countries. Canada's GDP per capita has been going straight downhill. Uh, so uh, this is a developed country. And uh, your developing countries are way down here. Canada is on its way to becoming a developing country. Congratulations. You get the government you deserve, I think, right? Uh, for May, 96% uh, of nothing going on. I think that's the right move. I think we have almost 100% uh, that you're going to get some announcement on the balance sheet because look, well, let's just jump right ahead. Let's just look at the reverse repo. Uh, down to 397 uh, uh, at this rate, June 29th, it hits zero. So you, you, uh, once it hits zero, then all your runoff goes right to the reserves and reserves will start dropping at a rapid pace. They don't want to do that. Uh, the lowest was April 15th, 327. That was, that was a pretty, a pretty interesting day. When I look, I look at it each day just to see where it is. It's at 327. I was like, whoa. Uh, effective federal funds rate 5.33 still. We look out to December. Uh, last week, three or, uh, or sorry, having more than three rate cuts, 6.2%, down to 3.3%. In fact, the market now is, I think, less than, less than 50 basis points, less than two rate cuts uh, versus uh, the Fed's three rate cuts. TGA. Uh, look at that, 929 up 257 billion. That's a 33% increase in the TGA. Well, tax season, right? And reserves down 286 billion. Why? Because you got to pay taxes. So uh, people with bank accounts say, transfer my money to the government. Well, all of that is reserves, right? If uh, you're taking your money out of your bank account, reserves drop, the TGA increases. This is not available. Uh, so reserves dropped. So uh, you have a reverse repo uh, facility dropping, which is a sign of uh, the excess liquidity in the repo market. Uh, you have reserves dropping, and I think the ample uh, ample spots about 2.5 trillion. Now well, 2.3 to 2.7. We'll call 2.5. So you have an, a runoff of another 1.22 in 13 months. This hits zero June 29th. You got 13 months if you're going to make a move on the balance sheet. I think May is the appropriate time to do it because 
uh, uh, you're going to have to announce it and then say, okay, well, when does it begin? If you announce it in May, saying it begins in June, uh, because uh, at this at this pace, uh, you're not going to see. By the time you get to to July, you're going to be hitting reserves directly and dropping that down each week. Okay, real rates are all up. Look at that. Well, in the two percent category, we're looking at the uh, cycle highs in about the mid twos, we're somewhere around the uh, first quartile in heading into the second quartile. We get another week of, uh, of Fed speak. We get PCE this week, that's ugly. Uh, we could we could start approaching um, the cycle highs on the real yields. Let's look at uh, Fed fund futures, uh, the way they uh, play out. Q2, uh, suggesting four and a half basis points, call it zero. Q3, 18. Q4, 17, 39.5 basis points, less than two cuts by the end of the year. Uh, versus 75 from the last summary of economic projections, I still think uh, a long Fed fund futures. Uh, December, uh, let me just move this over so we can see it. A long Fed fund futures, uh, either with December or January ending, still makes sense. TLT down again, another 1.26%, but outperformed SPY. SPY had an ugly week. Uh, implied volatility still hanging in here. I'm comfortable with TLT at these prices. If they're put to me, they're put to me. Uh, I see no reason why I would change my mind on any of this. I still think that the Fed, uh, no matter how much it wants to fight inflation, is seeing beyond the horizon the bigger mountain coming towards it, which is uh, the debt situation. Uh, and the credit rating agencies are also watching as well, and they don't look impressed. So you get another credit downgrade, and you could get a uh, a crisis uh, in in sovereign debt across developed countries because they're all indebted. Uh, so I think they're going to have to at some point fight that fight, and that's a bigger fight, and that fight's already showing up. When you look at the line item for interest, it's already showing up, and now they are in control of the size of that fight. The longer they keep rates where they are, the bigger that interest line item will become. The more difficult that fight will become. They make, they make the next fight more and more difficult each day. That this fight uh, should be declared done. I, I think that they should be lowering rates at this point uh, and uh, uh, starting to think about that next fight. Mortgage rates. 30-year fixed rate, 7.1, back over 7, up 22 basis points in one week. The U.S. Treasury was up 8 basis points Thursday over Thursday, so the spread has increased by 14 to 246. Last week, we got uh, quite a bit of housing data. Uh, mortgage apps up 3.3% for the week ending April 12th. The uh, NAHB housing index sitting at 51 in just a little into the expansion phase. Building permits for March down 4.3. Housing starts for March down 14.7. These are all month over month. Existing home sales for March down 4.3. I don't know that any of that would be uh, surprising. Uh, next week, Tuesday, we get new home sales uh, for March and pending home sales uh, for March. Month to date. Let's have a look at uh, some of the stocks we used to follow on the screen that just became uninteresting. Maybe they're moving into interesting territory. Uh, what has been the best performer? Agency, ABR, Annaly, all the home builders, the uh, home builder indexes, the uh, uh, REIT index, uh, digital realty, uh, and SPY, our best performer, ABR, down 4.75 agency, and Annaly pretty much moving in lockstep, uh, same business model, uh, uh, same, uh, same drivers of performance. Uh, ABR down 4.75, month to date, SPX down 5.46, uh, DHI down 13.6, uh, Lennar 12.6, Pulte 12.6, Toll Brothers 13.3, KB Homes 13.9, Hovnanian 17. Uh, not a good month for home builders and not a good, not good conditions going forward, I think, for home builders. Uh, XHB, Home Builder, uh, down 10.24. Home Construction down 11.6. REIT Index, IYR, down 8.8. .8. D 
Digital Realty down five. Uh, it's not so bad. Outperformed SPX. ABR uh, is the is the big winner there. OAS uh, spreads all increasing. I'd be surprised if they decreased. You see them decrease again. It's like okay, I I I can't make sense of of of, of what's going on there. But they're all increasing. So there is over last week with a sell off in in the market. There is some concern, although. I don't know that it's enough uh, to get excited about uh, 23 basis points here. Yeah, okay, 44 here on triple C, I would think. Well, it kind of makes sense to me. Okay, a uh, bit of an extended segment here. We're going to see if we can't discuss if something is going wrong with the AI story. Because if you watched NVIDIA last uh, week, especially on Friday, all the way down to 762, a Big dump on Friday. Some of it was ASML, uh, and another big part of it was Taiwan Semiconductor. So let's see what's going on here. Let's look at ASML. And ASML is critical because in lithography, they basically have a monopoly. If we're looking uh, at who sells the majority of the lithography machines, and we're talking like in the 90% uh, range, it's ASML. So I have their most recent quarter. This last column down here is Q1 2024. The column before it is Q4 2023. So it's quarter over quarter, which isn't a fair comparison because there could be seasonality. Uh, if you uh, follow the half year rule on depreciation, if you buy something in the fourth quarter and you can take half a year's depreciation, uh, you can save a lot of tax dollars <clears throat> or get some depreciation tax shield that year. So there could be some seasonality, not a fair comparison. Let's do year over year. Here's Q1 2023, Q1 2024. Red is year over year. Purple is quarter over quarter. <clears throat> Let's see how they did. Net sales, quarter over quarter, down 27%. Year over year, down 21.6%. New lithography systems sold. Just ignore the brown for now. New systems sold quarter over quarter down 41%. Year over year down 31%. So that would, year over year is handling any seasonality there. Uh, used lithography systems sold. It's just, they're small numbers. Uh, quarter over quarter down 63%. Year over year flat. Net bookings. Uh, quarter over quarter down almost 61% year over year, yeah, 3.76. Uh, gross profit, well, that should fall in line with net sales down 27 uh, quarter over quarter, down 21 year over year. Net income down 40% quarter over quarter, down 37% year over year. Could it just be Q1? Uh, let's look at Q2. <clears throat> Their guidance is 5.7 to 6.2 billion, and they say this. They expect 2024 sales to equal 2023 sales. Okay, well, uh, quarter over quarter uh, for, uh, or sorry, year over year for 2023, you're already down 21% out of the first quarter. That means Q2, Q3, Q4 has to beat last year. Guiding 5, 7, and 6, 2. Q2 of 23 was 6.9. So you're guiding lower than last year, but still saying that it's going to equal, which is pushing a lot of business into Q3 and Q4. Q3 and Q4 have to really uh, accelerate a lot. Uh, so guiding from 5.7 to 6.2 uh, at 6.9. Last year, they sold 107, uh, 107 in the second quarter. First quarter was 66. Uh, so I think if you're guiding lower, uh, you're not going to do more than 107. Uh, they're guiding uh, sort of in line with uh, margins uh, for gross margins. They're, they're guiding in line there, uh, but guiding lower. Let's look at uh, Taiwan Semi. Okay, what do we have here? We have first quarter 2024, some key metrics here. You have net revenue. You have two numbers for net revenue. The first one is putting it in US. The second one is in the local currency, 18.87. Um, let's just look at their guidance and then we'll go to their presentation. Uh, guiding for the second quarter, revenue expected to be 19.6 to 20.4. Uh, and this is in uh, US dollars. The first quarter was 18.87. So that's up 6% quarter over quarter. Yeah, it sounds a little light 
year over year, Q2 of 2023, 15.67 billion. And that's in U.S. dollars. So they're forecasting, uh, given this range, up 25 to 30 percent year over year, uh, but le being less profitable. Uh, the um, gross margin they're guiding 51 to 53. Last year was 54.11, so they're guiding well below uh, the uh, the range. Uh, the range that they have is well below last year. Uh, for operating margin, 40 to 42 is the guidance. Last year was 41.99, so uh, sort of in the range, but at the very higher end of the range. Even the uh, gross margin uh, that they're forecasting, uh, gross profit margin, 51 to 53, that is lower than Q1. Q1 was 53, uh, was 53.1. Um, Nvidia month to date is down 15.67, was down 10% on Friday alone. Uh, because of the guidance uh, from Taiwan Semi, uh, up six percent quarter over quarter, but that's for the whole the whole operation. Um, Taiwan Semi is the fab uh, for Nvidia chips, so we should look at well, uh, what what were the sales uh, by platform? In other words, by the nanometer size, because Nvidia plays at the five nanometer or less. Let's just flip over to Taiwan's um, presentation. <clears throat> we'll start here. Uh, this is Q1 2024, and um, the last two columns are the ones we want to pay attention to. The second last one is quarter over quarter. The last one is year over year. Uh, and uh, let's look at it in terms of the net revenue, uh, not in U.S. dollars, but net revenue in the local currency so that we uh, bring it down to you know, comparing apples to apples instead of uh, bringing currency exchange rate in there. Net revenue quarter over quarter down 5.3%, up 16.5% year over year, but down 5.3% uh, quarter over quarter. Uh, gross, mar uh, gross profit margin, eh, basically flat, but has contracted year over year. Operating margin, kind of flat quarter over quarter, a small increase, but has contracted year over year. Net profit margin, a uh, slight decrease quarter over quarter, call it flat, but it has contracted year over year. I think the concern here is the growth rates don't seem to match the growth rate uh, in, in AI. That if these are the growth rates, is there really that much activity going on? Especially quarter over quarter, the forecast for Q2 is only a 6% increase quarter over quarter. Uh, a 6% increase on a quarter that showed a 5.3% drop uh, over the previous quarter, over Q4. Let's look at their uh, first quarter revenue by technology, and we're really concerned about the seven, the five, and the three. Five nanometer making up 37%, uh, three nanometer, 9%. I think the NVIDIA H100 is a four nanometer, uh, four nanometer uh, technology. Uh, I don't think they have a 7 nanometer uh, technology in the chips that matter. Uh, so look at the green. Uh, if we go all the way back to uh, first quarter of 2021, rather small, and then it just uh, has exploded. This is a function of, uh, if you go back to the first quarter of 2021, uh, it's a function of two things. Number one, it's a function of, are, is there equipment uh, to fabricate at 5 nanometers and how many chips are available? The more equipment there is, the more chips that will be available to do. So that's why ASML was rather important, is because the sales of the uh, extreme ultraviolet lithography machines really took a dump quarter over quarter and year over year. Well, that will determine how many, uh, how many chips will actually be produced, because you can't make them without the equipment. The more demand there are for chips, the more demand there is for lithography machines. So if lithography ma machines start dropping off that considerably, it could be that the existing capacity is enough. And with a 6% growth quarter over quarter, making up for a 5.3% drop quarter over quarter, where's the demand uh, for lithography? Where's the demand for the chips? They're there, they're at these high levels, but where's the growth? And I think that was the concern on Friday is where's the growth? Uh, in this, because if we look at uh, the green bar, we see the blue bar here, seven nanometer increased slightly quarter over quarter, and the green increased slightly quarter over quarter, kind of looks flat, whereas three nanometer or less has dropped off. 
the green and the red is where the AI chips play and it's not showing uh, the growth quarter over quarter so we have to ask ourselves was this a, a a uh, big rush to build out and we're near the end of that build out or is this a multi-year build out? Okay, and let's have a look at NVIDIA uh, before we get there. We've looked at ASML and Taiwan Semi as far as any footprints. Super Micro Computer left another footprint as well. They uh, produce AI hardware. They typically pre-announce. Uh, last seven of eight uh, uh, quarters they pre-announced uh, and uh, their pre-announcement was, hey, we're, we're going to do better than we said we would. Uh, no pre-announcement this time. Well, that seems odd, right? If, if seven of your last eight quarters you've pre-announced and you said, hey, listen, we've done better than we thought we would and you're not pre-announcing, eh, what does that mean? That's AR hardware. So there's just, you know, another little bit of another piece of the puzzle. NVIDIA's market cap still sitting at $1.9 trillion. But uh, their price, they are now 21.77% below their all-time highs. On their chart, I drew some key, key levels here. Uh, look at this big green bar. Uh, this was uh, they're just a little over $300 here. This was May 2023 earnings. This was the first earnings uh, where the AI hype really began. If you go back to last May, NVIDIA's earnings report started the AI hype. And then every quarter after that, but you know, two quarters after that, every single company reporting was trying to figure out a way how to put AI into their conference call and into their uh, earnings report and into their forecast. AI, AI, AI was everywhere. And this was the beginning of the beta play that crushed uh, my beta trade last year was this. Uh, and then it hit a plateau for a while, just a little over 500, and then this is the beginning of the year. Uh, as soon as the uh, 2024 year started, it's like, okay, let's go. This is this is a huge thing. And off it went, and oh, well, hang on, maybe it's not such a huge thing, and uh, we're uh, coming down. Here was the February earnings. Uh, the uh, stock dipped before earnings, and then just ran up after earnings. So let's look at what we have, generative AI models. Uh, are showing little progress uh, a year and a half out from ChatGPT. ChatGPT started this whole AI thing. NVIDIA came along with the chips, and then suddenly we said, well, we have, we have ChatGPT, we have these AI chips. Looks like we have a whole new technology layer going on here. But to date, uh, the generative AI models really, really haven't shown that much improvement. They still hallucinate. Uh, they still really can only do a lot of linear uh, work. You have to train these on some data and data providers are starting to catch on, say, whoa, 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 you can't get our data for free. Uh, bigger models uh, have shown up with more parameters, uh, but still rather questionable output. Uh, or, or, you know, is it just too soon to tell? Um, we haven't seen a lot of progress in them to the point where we say, okay, there, is a general population-wide application that we can roll out right here, right now, uh, that is rock solid, that is a leap ahead of what we've seen so far. Or is it just too soon to tell? Uh, is this a multi-year build-out? Is this a new global technology layer? Or is this a four to eight quarters uh, um, driven by euphoria, a big investment rush into the space, a bust over capacity, followed by plunging prices. Um, ASML's numbers sort of say, well, maybe it's this. It's certainly not saying, no, this is a multi-year build-out. If I had to put one category to put ASML in, I'd put it over here. Taiwan Semi, I'd say, mm, it's, not, oh, it's not convincingly this one. It's not convincingly this one. Eh, super micro. You know, if uh, they had a precedent of pre-announcing that they're doing great and suddenly they're silent, eh, question mark over there. And I think that is what weighed on NVIDIA investors on Friday. And they said, why take the chance? Uh, we've had a good run. Uh, let's let's get out of there. Um, I would say that here are your levels. Uh, this is the level here that I'd be very careful of uh, if you do get support here. Um, Maybe that's where, where uh, it can play around for a while, but uh, we'd have to look for uh, the previous February earnings. 
Here's one thing that I can that I can be pretty sure about with Nvidia. I don't know which direction it's going. I don't know, but I know it won't go sideways for three years. It won't. Either this is a thing, and it and and they do have a defensible position, and up they go, or. This was a lot of hype. There was a lot of overbuilding, a lot of investment. I think a lot of companies are going to pull back and say, well, let's just, let's just hang out here for a while. I mean, can we not just rent some space on somebody's server right now? Maybe it'll be a bit more expensive in the short term, but can we just, can we just hold on, much like EV? How many companies announced we're building this factory, we're building this, we're building this battery factory, and now every company is pulling back saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Maybe the initial euphoria is worn off. You know, is this going to be a new technology layer out there in the world? Or is this a lot of uh, interesting results now, but just way, way, way too soon? You know, I'm reminded of the dot-com era where everybody was rushing to build out something on the internet everybody and then they would figure it out later on what the revenue model was but let's stake out our claim now so the internet built out really massively uh, and then it all sort of fell apart because well hang on here we are we think this is something but but is this the business model or is this the business model or is that the business model so a whole bunch of those companies went away you had massive overcapacity and in 2002, 2003, uh, Silicon Valley was empty. Uh, real estate was cheap. Buildings were empty. It was questionable whether that region would even survive. Uh, and, you know, 10 years after that, 12 years, 15 years after that, uh, the Internet found its stride. It, it did take quite a long time for it to find its stride where it is going, it is a layer of technology on the world. Is uh, this 1999 for AI, where there's a lot of building out, but nobody really knows what it is yet. Nobody really knows what the business model is or what the use cases are that are that are valuable and global. And you get this massive overbuilding for four or eight quarters, and then you have this big massive bust because no one's been able to figure out the business model. Uh, and then maybe in 10 years, you're going to have some big winning companies that come along. I mean, Facebook uh, wasn't part of the Internet revolution. Uh, it came uh, much later. Uh, Google's IPO came well after 1999. Uh, most of the Internet as we know it today, uh, you know, especially with Netflix. Netflix didn't come along till at least streaming, what, 2006, 2007, a good uh, seven, eight years after the dot-com euphoria. Could this be the case? Could the real winners start showing up in 2030, 2031, six, seven years after this? Maybe this is the necessary step to go through. Uh, NVIDIA is ground central for that, for, the, for, for that thought. I don't know the answer. And in 1999 with the dot-com, no one really knew the answer either. But a lot of people felt that a lot of these companies that were starting up uh, we're not going to be around in a few years. And I think with all of these AI companies coming out with, and we've got this AI product, we've got this AI model, I think we can say uh, for certainty uh, that a lot of these companies won't be around in a few years. So we have, uh, NVIDIA won't be reporting till May, by the way. Uh, they reported in May last year. It started the whole thing. It's, it's the one-year anniversary. Uh, could it end the whole thing? Uh, be interesting to see. I don't know. I wouldn't play with this one. It's 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 too volatile. I do know it's going to do one of one of two things uh, uh, over the next couple of years. It's either going to go much higher or it's going to go much lower. But uh, it won't be, you know, in a range. Okay, Tesla. The bad news for Tesla keeps on coming. They are now at a 52-week low. They have earnings on Tuesday. Uh, and keep in mind their Q1 deliveries were down 9% year over year at 387. So don't look for uh, a really great earnings uh, that they're going to pull it out of the bag. Um, more price drops on Saturday in the U.S. 2,000 per vehicle on Sunday. As I do this on Sunday, it was announced that uh, China uh, they dropped prices 2,000 there and on their full self-driving. Dropped the price from 12000 to 8000 in some regions, up to $4,000 off. 
because I mean, as you can sell those without a cost of goods sale. I mean, it's just pure margin. So, doing everything to try to raise some uh, revenue. This is a big deal. This is the first foreign auto company to be unionized by the UAW. Volkswagen uh, on Friday announced the results of the vote. Remember I told you they had a vote coming up. 73% in favor of a union. It's a done deal. Their next stop in May is Mercedes and they will be coming for Tesla. The, the idea that they're going to just, oh no, let's leave those guys alone. That's laughable. They will be coming for Tesla. And they are, uh, they have momentum behind them. Big victories uh, with the big three in Detroit. They now have Volkswagen. Mercedes uh, falls in May. It's just inevitable that Tesla will be unionized. Um, the robo-taxi in August, no. That's, that's simply not going to happen. Or there'll be an announcement that it's just around the corner. We're very close and it's just around the corner and we're going to dedicate our attention to this and sign up now and everybody's vehicle. If you take the, the full self-driving now, you will have an appreciating asset because once the robo-taxi software is ready, we can make everybody's car a robo-taxi. Your insurance company is going to massively disagree with that. Good luck. Not only that, the technology for that to happen, no, no. That's a big no, a big giant no. Uh, they're robot. Uh, robot sales anytime soon? No. That's a big, massive no. So what do they have? They are, at heart, a car company. And they are suffering from the pressures of the auto industry. They will have auto industry margins and they will have an auto industry valuation. Uh, to revisit the forecast I made back in 2022, June 8, 2022, I posted the video at the very end. I give my uh, best forecast for the trajectory of Tesla. Uh, 2024, end of year 2024, I project the market cap of $252 billion. They are currently at $460 billion. Uh, given a price of $146.90, if they get to $252, that's an end of year price target of $80.34. The last earnings call from Tesla was entertaining. Uh, so uh, Tuesday, Tuesday night, they have uh, their earnings call. If I could uh, offer you uh, my best recommendation here, it would be the Kirkland brand of popcorn uh, in the microwave for about uh, 2 minutes, 40 seconds. You put it on 3 and then you stand there and when there's about 20 seconds left, you hear a pop pop that's when you take it out it's the best right it's the best a coke zero with ice i think is the best and you'll be set up for the conference call you're not going to want to go through this without a soda and popcorn it is going to be entertaining i think because uh with all of this going on 52 week low uh getting rid of the uh the project for the low cost uh, ev Saying that this is robo taxi coming in August, talking about your robot as the most advanced humanoid robot in the world, and that what is a car? A car is nothing but a robot on wheels. It is going to be one interesting conference call. Uh, Musk also asking for his $55 billion uh, compensation package to be reinstated. The analyst questions are going to be brutal. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this conference call. Um, I think the biggest risk that is not priced in to Tesla right now is the UAW. Okay, HG, copper, 52-week high closing. Uh, the, last, uh, the last time it was at this level was June 8, 2022. Uh, gold, all-time high closing, 2406.70. Not the all-time high, but the all-time high closing. It's the closing that matters. Uh, any technical analyst will tell you that it's if on, on, on a daily chart, it's the closing that matters. All-time high clothing, uh, clothing, <laughs> closing. So for uh, copper, we have FCX uh, reporting earnings this week. Uh, they are a copper producer uh, with a, a large gold co-product. Uh, and Newmont uh, is a, a large gold producer with a large copper co-product. And both copper and gold 
are setting uh, are setting 52 week highs with gold at all time highs. Now, if we're we're looking at Q1, the reporting for Q1, you have to look at copper prices over Q1. Uh, this is the beginning of January. There is the end of March. Uh, I've just sort of eyeballed where I think the average price is about three uh, about 390. We'll look at their sensitivity chart in a second. Uh, finished at 49.51, below the $50 strike, at which I would uh, lose some shares. Hit an all-time high, uh, sorry, not all-time high, 52-week high of 52.42, sitting below 49.51. I kind of like them to hang out there for just a little bit longer. Uh, Newmont, uh, I had sold the 37.50 puts. I'm more than happy with their uh, stock price performance. Um, closed at 39.02. Uh, looking at gold, I'm eyeballing an average gold price about 21.75. Newmont's forecast was based on 1900, uh, $1,900 gold. They're 21.75. What is going to matter more is the guidance, because look at where copper is gone. Look at where gold is gone. So if we're thinking about well, where's the uh, uh, average realized price for copper? If I had to do an, an average now, where are we? Well over four dollars, and uh, for gold, uh, sitting, uh, you know, pushing 23. 60 2370 over 2175 their guidance is is going to be golden on this one <laughs> golden get that i i didn't mean that i just said it just now uh and then i saw it and i laughed uh so 390 somewhere in there i think would be near the average realized price uh for copper 2175 the average realized price for gold i'm just eyeballing it but i think it'll be uh it'll be in there let's have a look at uh, their price sensitivities Okay, this is for Freeport, uh, Freeport EBITDA and cash flow at various copper prices. And they're assuming 2,000 ounce gold, $19 per pound for molybdenum uh, and copper at $4 uh, for average of 2025, 20, 2026 20, expected. So jumping over 2024, well, we're already at the 450. But here's their sensitivity on EBITDA for every dime. Uh, they add four dollars, four hundred and thirty million to their EBITDA. Uh, if they're already uh, at four fifty from, uh, if if their estimate was for four dollars, they're already at four fifty right now. Uh, that's two billion dollars, five times uh, four hundred and thirty million. What is it? Two point one billion dollars already added on to EBITDA. For gold, they're assuming two thousand dollars an ounce. Uh, every fifty dollars is seventy-five million, so every hundred dollars is one hundred and fifty million, and we're sitting somewhere around twenty-four hundred now. Uh, so there's another six hundred million on top of the two point one billion. These are some big numbers uh, for sensitivities. Let's look at uh, Newmont. Uh, this is uh, outlook for twenty twenty-four. So that's sort of a nice look at their assumption was nineteen hundred dollars uh, an ounce of gold for twenty twenty-four. Every hundred dollar change. Uh, for total for Newmont, six hundred and seventy-five million from nineteen hundred. Just bring that up to the twenty-four hundred th that we have right now. Uh, now this is for the full year. The first quarter, I'm figuring the average realized price was somewhere below twenty-two hundred. Uh, if gold stays where it is around the twenty-four and even moves higher, given the amount of sovereign debt out there uh, and the the worrying position of it. Wouldn't be surprising if gold held these territories or even went higher. But let's say that you had 2400 as the average for the year. That's $500 more than uh, the assumption of 19. Five times 675 million is $3.2 billion, uh, which is significant for Newmont. Have a look at copper uh, price uh, per ton. Uh, uh, well, they got a price per ton. 88.18. If you price it out uh, for gold, that's they're basically price not price it out per pound. Sorry, they're basically pricing this out at four dollars a pound. Um, a change uh, uh, in the price of ton 550. This is every 25 cents. So in other words, it went from four dollars to 425. That's what 550 on uh, a ton would be. Every 25 cents adds 90 million, and we're at 450 now. So there's another 180 million. On top of the three point some odd billion. Now, uh, copper is a coal product. That's why it's rather small. Same with uh, Freeport. If we go back to Freeport and we look at the sensitivity uh, for gold, uh, it doesn't add as much as the sensitivity for copper because Freeport produces copper, 
and gold comes along. Newmont produces gold and copper comes along, but still, uh, you know, 180 million extra on just the co-product, uh, 3.2 billion more on, uh, on, on, on the main product. Um, I like Newmont. Uh, I don't know that I like it for any upside. I like it for the puts. Uh, because I, I think it's well supported by the prices in the market and I still like Freeport and I think the last report I read on uh, on copper still showed uh, I think it was Morgan Stanley still showing a shortage going well into 2025 and 2026 one of the drivers was EV mm, that is starting to look a little bit questionable but but what uh, Bloomberg uh, ran a story uh, I think it was on Friday, talking about uh, EV. Uh, the biggest growth segment in that space, plug-in hybrids. If you go back to the video I did a couple years ago uh, in 2022 about uh, EV uh, and ICE batteries, I said that the best place to be would be a plug-in hybrid, where your battery was small enough 10 to 12 uh, kilowatt batteries small enough that you could drive 40 50 miles a day without ever touching the gas tank for most commuters not commuters sorry for most uh, people who uh, work in the city or just go to the mall or uh, do errands during the day they could they could go for months without ever hitting the gas tank but then you never have to worry about range because you have the gas tank so it would help commuters as well. I think that's the place to be. And then you can slowly transition people to all electric as the infrastructure builds out. Well, there we are. It looks like a uh, battery, uh, the plug-in hybrid, not just a hybrid, but the plug-in hybrid uh, looks like a nice transition vehicle. And just to finish my point from the previous screen, I ended it and I thought, hang on a second, I didn't even make my point. If we do have a uh, plug-in hybrid that is sort of uh, showing growth while EV uh, is not, at least the demand for copper would still be there because it would still require more in a plug-in hybrid than an ICE vehicle. So while it's not the full EV story, it's still there. Let's look at the S&P 500 starting to become more reasonable. 19.8 times the forward earning versus 20.44. Uh, the forward earnings estimate really haven't changed that much, but man, have we come off the boil uh, from uh, where we were uh, just a couple of weeks ago. The surprise factor on earnings for Q1 with 70 companies reporting is 10.1%, 10.1 above expectation. So if these are the expected earnings. Well, what if they were 10% higher? What if they continued with this? then you would have a forward multiple of 17.98. That's not bad. Where's the risk here? The risk is in the estimate that the companies uh, that are reporting. Uh, I mean, we've seen the financials so far, but we haven't really seen the industrials or the uh, technology or the communications companies reporting. And this week, we got a lot of that coming. Although, uh, <laughs> try to find an earnings calendar uh, that is correct. Uh, that seems like the hardest thing in the world to do. Implied volatility still out there uh, for the week coming up. Earnings, uh, LSEG says 159. SB Global says no, it's 111. Sector Spider says no, it's 145. And listen, this has got to be one of the most objective things you can do. You can, there's 503 companies. I don't want to take the time to do it, but... If I, if I had to do it, I'd say, how can I be wrong? There are 503 companies. You can sign up uh, on Investor Relations, uh, leave your email address, and you will get the press release of when they're going to announce their earnings. All 503 companies have already announced the date of when their earnings are. So before earnings season even begins, you know exactly when each of these 503 companies are reporting. There is no subjectivity here. It's the easiest thing to figure out. It's time consuming and tedious, but it's objective. You're telling me that you can't get it right, but yet you and you charge big dollars for access to data that requires a lot more decisions to be made. If you can't get the objective stuff right, why the hell would I ever give you a penny for this other stuff? How can I ever trust any of the numbers you have for anything if you can't get this right? 
Am I wrong here? Is there something I'm missing that makes figuring out who's reporting that week bloody difficult? Is it, is it so difficult that you got to put a committee on it and no one ever gets the right number? Now, I can see if you have 10 different analysts across the world all looking at IBM, they'll all come up with 10 different numbers. I can see that. But when is Netflix reporting earnings? You give that question to 10 people, you should, there's one correct answer. Come on, guys, you, you, you're, you're hurting your own revenue over here by looking like idiots over here. Can we all just get together and, I mean, if it's too hard to do, have your IT team give me a call. And in five minutes, I'll walk them through an algorithm that can get it done. But come on, man. Anyways, <laughs> let's have a look at, I don't know, let's have a look at an earnings calendar. What, what does it matter which one, right? Let's just have a look at one. Okay, I'm going to just use SB Global. I thought about, well, why not take the one that has the most companies? Yeah, but what if those companies aren't reporting? Well, let's take the one that has the fewest companies. Yeah, but what if you miss some companies? My thinking is the one that has the fewest companies probably has a 100% overlap with everybody else who's saying that more companies are reporting. And, well, we'll just go with that. So here I've uh, put it in order in terms of the industry that they're in, communication services. We see them all reporting this week. Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. Uh, you also have Meta in there. Um, if you're into cable, you got Comcast and Charter. Consumer discretionary, General Motors, Tesla. Uh, Tesla is Tuesday after the close. Remember my recommendation, Kirkland brand popcorn. Um, you also have a home builder in there, Pulte, Pulte Group. Uh, Ford is in here as well. Ford, GM, Tesla this week. Uh, consumer staples, uh, what else have you got? You've got energy in there, uh, energy services, Halliburton, Baker Hughes. Uh, Chevron, as far as energy, direct energy, you still have a bunch of financials uh, in here. A bunch of healthcare, if you're into uh, that space. The industrials, let's look who's uh, reporting. Lockheed Martin, uh, UPS, uh, Boeing. Oh, Boeing, that'll be interesting, right? Boeing. Uh, anything else that uh, grabs my attention here? Um, well, nothing much that's jumping out of me. Information technology, who we got? Texas Instrument, uh, IBM, LAM Research, uh, Intel. Service now is sort of a big AI name as well. Uh, you got Intel here. Uh, and into materials, Freeport. There you go. This is Tuesday. Uh, if it doesn't say ATC, it's Tuesday morning. So Freeport, Tuesday morning. Uh, where do we get GM? Go back up. GM is Tuesday morning as well. Uh, Tuesday after the close is Tesla. Tuesday will be an important day. Uh, important. An interesting day, let's say. Then you have some real estate and uh, some utilities, probably companies that uh, you're, you've never heard of. If you have a more inclusive earnings calendar, there you go. Uh, interactive Brokers has an earnings calendar by day. So if you have Interactive Brokers, what I would do is go to their calendar at the beginning of the day uh, and get rid of every other category and just look for uh, for earnings and it'll give you the list of, of uh, the companies that are reporting earnings that day. I don't think it limits it to just S&P 500 companies though, but at least you'll have uh, you'll have something for the day. Uh, and um, and that's it. 